All right, hello everyone. Welcome to um, this hang time with Archives of American Art. I'm Megan, you hear from me often in emails, and this is Archives of American Art curator, Mary Savin. Would you like to say hello? Hi, welcome. We're really excited to talk about diaries today, and I'm gonna let Mary give us a little bit of um, placement location so you guys can see that we are actually um, participating in this hangout from a very special location. And I'm gonna just adjust the volume here. Sure. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Welcome, you are currently in the Archives of American Arts Lawrence A. Fleischmann Gallery, which is located in the Donald W. Reynolds Center for American Art and Portraiture, which is a mouthful, but it's also the home of the American Art Museum and the National Portrait Gallery. And we have this small dedicated space here where we do about three to four exhibitions a year on exhibitions, or on uh, documents in our collections. So happy Friday, everyone. I'm curious to know, and if you are watching, to just chime in on whether or not you yourself keep a diary. Do you keep a diary? Sometimes. I always end up getting a few pages in, and then I you know, forget, yeah. and then I come back to it, and I think, what was even going on no. when I was ready? <laughs> I'll get to that, because a lot of artists do the same thing. Well, it's good to know how to learn. And if you do keep a diary, what kind of diaries people keep? Do you keep a traditional diary, pen and paper, a moleskin journal perhaps, or do you keep a digital diary? I think the kind of formats are changing for diaries, and it's been really interesting to talk about that with uh, other diarists who have come to the exhibition. And I'm also wondering, if you keep a diary today, would you let someone transcribe it? Let alone put it in a public collection that will put it online for people to transcribe. Because here at the Archives of American Art, it is our mission to acquire, preserve, and make available the primary resources that document American art history. In addition to diaries, the Archives has in its collections photographs, scrapbooks, sketchbooks, and correspondence. We have more than 20 million items in our collections. Of course, not all of them are digitized but we do have a very robust digitization program. So we will be keeping transcribers busy for many years to come. And that's what we like to hear, yay! Very busy. Uh, so through our exhibitions, we try to draw on our collections. And what we try to do, especially with these exhibitions, as well as our public programs and our publications, including our Archives of American Art Journal, we try to open up the lives of American artists so that we can help people and ourselves relate to their lives and better understand their work. So as a resource, diaries in particular offer unparalleled insight into the life, the everyday life of an artist, including who they were meeting with, who were they, who were they getting tea with, uh, what kind of appointments they made, what they were looking at in museums and galleries, what they were inspired by, uh, were they inspired by other artists or were they, was it everyday things that they were looking at in their environs and we have examples of all of that in the exhibition. So for this exhibition we try to arrange documents in, or diaries into six different themes that would be service points of entry for people coming to the exhibition and we're hoping that through these points of entry people will be able to relate in some way to the diaries. So first is perseverance, that's the first case. And I wish I could show you the case, but it just is jam-packed with diaries right now. We probably have 400 diaries in this case alone. And it starts with the smallest diary that we have on view. Let me grab it. Hold it out, the yeah. case this is really today. This is really amazing to see because <laughs> volunteers, you will recall if you have transcribed Ethelie Moore's diary. Yep. Here it is, it's so small. It looks just so much larger than that. <laughs> I know, actually, when we borrowed this to a museum recently, the, the exhibitions team didn't believe our measurements, so they made a case mount that was way too big because they just didn't believe that it was so small. So these are the diaries of F. Lewis Mora. We have one out, but he maintained more than 240 of them, and we have all of them at the archives. And he kept them every single day, month by month, for decades. And it's tiny, and he had very tiny handwriting. And if you remember transcribing it, he also did wonderful little illustrations in each one. So that shows the artists who are able to persevere 
and write diaries every single day over the course of decades. And a lot of them, which is really interesting, is they kept the same format. That's really fascinating. Yeah. So, so in this case, and uh, volunteers, I'll try and grab some other uh, snapshots of this space so you can yeah. understand what the exhibition is like. But about how many artists are represented within this? This case just has three artists: uh, F. Lewis Mora, James Smiley, who was a 19th century. He's really active in the 19th century New York art world. They are these beautiful, very soft leather-bound books that he maintained for quite a while, for uh, from the late 1860s to the early 20th century. And then my favorite diarist is Catherine Lane Weems because she, like me, um, loved dogs. <laughs> and this is this is a book, one of her diaries, and they're interesting because every single diary is uh, has a lock on it, and they're really easy to pick. I don't know why she used them over decades, but they um, they do show her her uh, growth as a young woman. She started keeping them as a teenager, so when she was well into her seventies and eighties. And we have um, decades of those, and they all have these cute little locks on them. And she talked a lot about her development and maturity as an artist. Who was she became a sculptor, a sculptor of animals, including a lot of dogs. She was a really interesting artist that not a lot of people know about. We have a couple of comments back on sure. people keep diaries. So oh, yeah. like, um, Neil uh -huh. says that he actually uses. Twitter as his public facing yeah, diary, yeah. which is something really interesting to think about when you mentioned that. I thought, actually, I probably do the same thing on yeah. Tumblr in personal space. And Siobhan says she keeps a calendar in her diaries. Yeah, we have a lot of calendars in our collections that are more um, daily records of appointments and helping people keep track of the future. But Twitter is really interesting for how people imagine what a diary is today. I also think Instagram is really interesting because a lot of people keep food diaries of everything they eat. And the structure is pretty comparable to a lot of diaries we have here because we do have people who travel to places like Paris and keep a detailed record of every single thing they've eaten, including, and then they tuck menus into the diary or into their scrapbooks. So what's interesting about the diary is that it kind of can draw, there can be a line that can be uh, crossed between public and private, but the structure does remain the same as far as people wanting to document what's happening every day. So the smallest diary in the exhibition is F. Lewis Mora, and the biggest one has also been transcribed, and that is the diary of Rufus Peel. And I'll grab it so you can see how big it is. I feel like a fan of light here. So it's large, it's much larger, bound volume, and he had very beautiful uh, copper plate script that I think as a transcriber would be easy to get the hang of as you go through. Um, it's still being transcribed now, so you can uh, begin transcribing it in a minute. And review. Lots yeah. of opportunities to review too. I know, and I was reviewing it yesterday, and it really does give insight to what it's like to be, <laughs> to be alive in the 1860s, because it seems like he's doing a lot of gardening, a lot of repairs around his house, and then visiting people. and traveling and making the effort to reach out to a lot of people and he would document it. And what's uh, significant about this, and this is one of the other, the second theme in the exhibition is uh, historical events. So artists who um, wrote in their diaries and described major historical events. And this starts, the exhibition starts with the death of Abraham Lincoln, who when he was assassinated, his, his corpse went on this uh, tour to New York and to Philadelphia. And he saw it when it was in Philadelphia and it was this major public event. And they waited in line. His peel did with his daughter Mary. Line was too long so they weren't able to see Lincoln at that time, but they were invited back through the back door. And Mary was actually able to sit with the corpse and sketch it, which was a great opportunity for a budding artist at the time to be able to see the president so close and it's Documented in this diary by Peel. Uh, during our last ITC discovery, which mm -hmm. was a month ago this coming Monday, so mm -hmm. volunteers can keep in mind if you want to share discoveries this coming Monday, you can use my ITC discovery. One of our volunteers mm -hmm. um, mentioned this diary mm -hmm. in learning about the ways in which news traveled yeah. in that time period during the Civil War and then uh, news of what was happening on the battlefront got back to mm -hmm. very quickly. 
Mm -hmm. um, it's really interesting to think about, especially yeah. thinking about contemporary communications and things like Twitter, that with these informal networks got news around really quickly. I know, and it, this did give me more appreciation for how difficult it was to keep in touch with people and even, even just being able to see them face to face and the efforts that people had to go undergo to take a horse to go see a neighbor and it would be the day's event. So we have historical events like uh, the assassination of Lincoln, the Civil War, World War I and World War II. Those have um, both been added to the Transcription Center through World War I is through John Storrs and he writes about this difficult position of being an American citizen and living in France during World War I and he was often uh, reflecting on what he wanted his role to be in the war, whether it would be to fight for the United States or if he was wanting to join the French Army. So that's a really interesting introspective diary and it does reflect his artistic idiom of being a very um, reflective and thoughtful artist. We also have the World War II diary of Abraham Ratner that was in the Transcription Center and I think that was transcribed in about a day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And um, the, old, the most recent one that we have is by an artist named Janice Lowry. And I just wanted to show this one. It's not on the Transcription Center. I think it would be a major challenge, maybe even more challenging than the Oscar Bloomer Diary. Because she, as part of her journaling process, she didn't just write, but she mainly collaged. So her, and she, we have about 14 boxes of these kind of diaries. And as she, she started them in the 70s, and up until 2011, they became more and more elaborate as time went on. So it's a key part of her creative process. So let me just try to, it's hard to, you can see the collage. She puts little, she does drawings. I don't know if you can see that actually. Um, I think she really close to the in. Let me know. And these are actually all on our website, too, and they're digitized and very high resolution. So. Yeah, that's a great segue, actually, to, to share that um, the Archives of American Art have an, uh, you know, an unparalleled resource in their mm -hmm. website and the ability to explore not only the diaries that we've transcribed, but other things that are part of um, collections mm -hmm. and letters and correspondence and mm -hmm. photographs and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. So be sure to visit that. <laughs> This is a great plug for our website. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so this diary, um, we put on the exhibition because she has an entry on September 11, 2001. So it is our most recent diary entry. And I can go to it and read what she wrote. She does little clippings that were happening in the news. And I think her response is very relatable people who remember it. So this is the entry. And at the very bottom in the right corner, she writes, the only solution for me to do is to do ordinary things, just regular things. And she has an account of it. And these are the days following. So when, if you were to be looking through this, are you, is there interpretation of these events? Because this is mm -hmm. communicating through collaging as opposed to maybe narrative right. you know, or, or even calendar entries. Um, how, how, as a curator, do you go about interpreting an item that's like this as opposed to, you know, apologies for saying to one of these questions, but just it's very interesting to see how she's yeah. documenting her life. I think the methodology is similar to approaching it because you can still see her sense of anguish, even if it's collage through forms because she does draw on it. Mm -hmm. And you can see her confusion, and she writes about it. And through her drawings, you can tell if, in the case of the ones that are the events of 9 11 and then how it unfolded in the media, you can see her political response as well as her effective response and how she, um, how she was trying to digest what was happening. And I think that's similar to a lot of the artists who are using words to say that's right. Not. Exactly. Um, Especially someone like John Storrs, who was very thoughtful in their diaries. I mean, a lot of people, maybe Peel in particular, they don't necessarily talk about their emotions to a lot, to in many cases. But they're more about their observations of what they did and what they saw. But there are examples of artists who do use their diary to work through what's going on in their everyday lives. And would you? Um 
Jana Slowry. J A N I C E. And Lowry is L O W R Y. Okay. We have a lot of her uh, journals digitized on our website, so you should search it. It was really cool. Really beautiful to page through. So those were the historical events and um, we also had childhood diaries because it's really interesting. A lot of people do start diaries when they're children and it's interesting to see early creative inclinations of a lot of these artists. You probably saw it with Reginald Marsh. His diary was on the Transcription Center. And he was raised by a muralist, so he was in an artistic family and from an early age when he was just a teenager, he started doing those little sketches in his, in his diary. He was friends with Lloyd Goodrich, who was mentioned all the time in the diaries, and Lloyd Goodrich became one of the first directors of the Museum of Modern Art. So it's interesting to see that a childhood neighbor, someone who used to skip Latin class with him, <laughs> was often mentioned as one of his, um, in his cohort when he was young. Very interesting. Are there other um, connections within childhood that stand out to you that are similar to that? So I know yeah. a lot of times we talk about adult relationships yeah. and connections, but the childhood. That's a good question. Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney definitely, when she was a teenager, was rubbing elbows with very important people, and she had access to art collections that was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But as far as her peers, when she was a teenager, that might be a question for the transcribers if they've come across a lot of examples of. Names. I think uh, maybe not in the artist diaries, but yeah. I know that volunteers would say Mary Henry was very connected. Oh, okay. There's diaries of yeah. the first secretary's daughter that have been transcribed. Oh, she was friends with Ted Lincoln and other people who um, was writing about who was visiting with her family mm -hmm. in the castle. So if you'd like to look at any of these mm -hmm. you know, diaries that have already been transcribed, of course you can visit them in the transcription center. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to think across, mm -hmm. um, across our different collections, whether someone was a mm -hmm. Keeping a diary in whatever space they, uh -huh. they happen to have as a professional occupation. Uh -huh. That's um, and someone had had written in advance with a question about the Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney diaries because we did put on the transcription center, and in the exhibition is her childhood diary of when she went to Paris in 1890. And that collection is actually being digitized by the Archives of American Art right now. So in the future, I, I don't know. Probably with, uh, well, I won't give a timeline, but it is being digitized. And when the entire collection goes online, we have talked about putting all the diaries on the transcription center because I think that corpus of how once from her childhood to, I think when she wrote diaries until 1939 and she died in 1942, and she wrote a lot of different kinds of diaries. She wrote travel diaries, she wrote an engagement diary when she was engaged to Henry Payne. Whitney, and then um, she wrote a honeymoon diary on her honeymoon. And then she kept a lot of records of her social events as well. So I think having a transcribed body of her entire collection of diaries could be really, really valuable to researchers. And we could do some really cool things with that. So stay tuned for that. It's still, I think, in the later phases of digitization right now. But I did call it in case people wanted to see the size of the diary. I think it's always so hard to tell when you're online how big or small something is. So I pulled some of the diaries just to give a sense of scale. So we have that childhood, historical events, perseverance. Oh, there's a whole case. We were just talking about this at the beginning of um, how I'm writing a diary. People actually write a lot about how they're going to write a diary. And they often try to commit to it, usually on January 1, so you need to do a diary. You know, this is, this is what happened in the last year. I look forward to the next year and writing and keeping this diary. And there's one, it's not in the exhibition, but one diarist uh, was talking about how he hadn't kept a diary since he was a kid and he got a bike and the bike distracted him, so he stopped keeping a diary. But he went on this trip to Europe and he started keeping a diary again. And he wonders when, how long that will, that will go on because not everybody has the perseverance. I personally never for a whole year. I don't know if I ever have either. <laughs> have to go so we do have people talking about how they're going to keep a diary and there's one that I did want to read from because it's 
interesting compared to um, a lot of people, I think, would imagine would be embarrassed maybe if their diaries were made available just recently after they had written them. A lot of people are more comfortable with obviously letting go of their diaries at a certain point in their lives because that's where we have a lot of them. But Jack Torkoff, who was an abstract expressionist painter, was very confident in his abilities as an artist while he was uh, writing his diary. And he was a very intellectual artist. And he wrote a lot about why he kept a diary in his diary. I just wanted to read a quote that I thought was interesting. So on Christmas Eve, 1954, he wrote, I begin to wonder about these pages. What are they for? Why do I write these entries? Partly they satisfy my love of records, a manifestation of ego. Partly they constitute an effort to discover my true emotions. Partly they are a literary effort, not without a desire, that they sometime in the future be read if only by those who know me. And he knew they were going to be read. They've actually been published since. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think it's, some people are very self-aware and they, have a, they do have the expectation that their diaries are not necessarily private. But some people, most, I think most of the artists in this exhibition certainly thought that their diaries were a private place for reflection and introspection at the time. Did any, um Artists ever write about returning to their diaries or like coming back to a previous page or rereading? Yes, there is one that is by an artist. Um, she was a muralist and she does write, Old oh, diary, I found you again. I'm so happy to be in your pages again. And I'm linking up her name right now, but she was a muralist and we have her collection digitized. Excellent. Think of the name. We can all share If there's anyone from the archives tuning in, it's the Southwest Muralist. <laughs> they have a collection of guys. And it's a really great collection. Yeah, they do. And a lot of them, including Jeff Torkoff, do start writing and then they take breaks. And they'll come back and they'll say, oh, I'm returning to my diary. I'm going to do it this time. <laughs> cool. It makes sense that it would be the beginning of the year. Yeah, we have a lot in January 1. And we're actually probably planning a little public program around that in the new year because it's a time for commitment. It's a fresh start. This is the year. Yeah. We're going to keep a diary. Um, and as you know, we have a lot of uh, projects in the Transcription Center mm -hmm. that were from scientists who kept journals mm -hmm. and diaries in addition to their uh, collecting yeah. photos. But many of them have many more diary entries when they like, can't go out collecting or they're mm -hmm. bad weather or they're yeah. preventing their um, one example I'm sure the volunteers can chime in uh, is um, when Billy Dahl who mm -hmm. wrote day after day after the train, train again, <laughs> it's still raining. I can't go outside of the thing, basically. We have a diary like that by a landscape artist named Jervis McEntee, and his diary was one of the inspirations for the exhibition. It, uh, and it, this exhibition was in New York in a previous form about 10 years ago, and Jervis McEntee's diary is too fragile to exhibit right now, but it, he did write it almost every day about the rain and the weather. And his landscapes are very dreary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where was he? He was at Hudson River School. Okay. okay. So he was up in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. and it was always cold and gray and rainy. And that's, that's what his diary is. And that's been transcribed. And we've done some work with that transcription. So then we have, in addition to the act of writing a diary and keeping a diary, our fifth theme is technique and process. There are a lot of artists who specifically use their diary as a way to start ideas and think through their works. Um, the most uh, interesting and complex one uh, that's been on Transcription Center is, of course, the famous Oscar Blumner diary. <laughs> I just had to pull it out to show you. This has been conserved, so it's in a very nice uh, conserved bind uh, binding right here. And Blumner used his diary really as a starting point for his works of art. They really, his paintings would evolve from the diary into the finished project. And what's really great about his diary, then, especially for researchers, is how you can see him develop an idea and his theory on color in particular. 
He was a really, he was a leading color theorist, modernist artist, and in his diary, he would take very, very detailed notes on, and maps or diagrams of painting subjects, and he would write in in the margins, on the on the actual sketches, really detailed. Uh, contemplations of color, what he wanted it to look like, and he would write about it. And I think the volunteers who helped transcribe that diary <laughs> would have a lot to say about his thought processes, the complexities of his thought processes, and how he used his diary as a format for looking through those ideas. He was very self-critical at some yeah. points, um, writing about his ability to, to learn and grasp yeah. some of that information as well. I was really surprised mm -hmm. when I'm transcribing an interview yeah. with this diary, and I was really surprised to see how um, mm -hmm. uh, frustrated yeah. maybe he was, that he couldn't grasp things more quickly. He was very frustrated. I think he just had so much going on in his mind that he couldn't make manifest in the real world. And that was a constant struggle. That was, I'm sure, I can imagine, it was very frustrating for him. So this is the Bloomer Diary in its physical form. And a lot of other artists also um, use their diaries as ways to sketch out ideas. Uh, Ruben Tam, he was a Hawaiian-born artist, and he actually wrote a lot of poetry in his diaries, and then the poetry would often form and, or, turn in, or turn into landscape ideas. He's a landscape painter. He painted often the Hawaiian coast as well as later in his life the main coast, and he would talk a lot about the landscape and the color and just the idea of being at sea and what that meant to him. And so he had really beautiful poetic diaries about his process and the relationship between words and how often words weren't enough for him. And landscapes were a way to make visible his ideas of nature. We have, I uh, just want to share two comments from okay. some of our volunteers who said, Amy, who had the opportunity uh -huh. to visit the um, mm -hmm. exhibit in person, exhibition in person, has said that she also remembers that um, Lynch Lazelle's, I'm saying. Yeah, Lynch Lazelle. Um, started her diary later in the mm -hmm. year, but backdated to January. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, Shannon made a um, recollection that Stores was very thoughtful about World War One and his reaction to the very moving to read mm -hmm. about his experiences during that time. They really were. Yeah, Blanche Lazelle's was hard to date when we were working on the exhibition. Same with Jack Torkovs, actually, because they would start with one day, and then a couple of days later, Jack Torkov actually wrote, oh, the other day was wrong. Sorry about that. I actually meant this day, which is confusing because it was his birthday. I didn't even remember his own birthday. So. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that someone said that Ruben's Peel was gardening on his birthday, <laughs> that he wrote about gardening on his birthday. And that didn't really describe anything else except for the time spent in no surprise birthday party for yeah. Peel <laughs> that year. And the sixth case is called, it's just on the idea of a day in the life. And what was frustrating about this exhibition is because of the physical capacity of the, ex of the diaries, we can't actually allow people to turn the pages. You know, you can't, we have to put them in, protect them. So it's frustrating that if you're coming to the exhibition, you can't page through and read more than one page. You can go on our website, but not a lot of people do that who are in the exhibition. So what we wanted to do was for one case, we turn the pages every single week. So whenever you come to the gallery today, it's November 21, there's actually a diary entry that's open to today. And that's a little bit dull today. It's, um, James Britton, the portrait painter, he's just, just kind of talking about who we saw that day. November 22nd, tomorrow, was really interesting because we have the diary of Charles Greenshaw out. And on November 22nd, uh, 1965, he talks about the assassination of JFK. And he just has a small little asterisk in his diary on November 22nd, saying, heard about this on the radio, shocking news. And also on November 22nd was Thanksgiving for Mariette Charlton, and she drew a little picture of a turkey. 
So we do have ways for people to see what happened on this day in history, but 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and you can see what the everyday life of an Empress was. And usually it's a lot of time in the studio, a lot of time teaching, a lot of time being taught, and that can be really interesting too, to um, sort of get small snippets of it. So we have six diaries in that case that show people what's going on on this day. So those are the six cases that we have and the themes. And I'm happy to answer any more questions about well, I know our volunteers always have questions about, and uh, I know every single day will be a different mm -hmm. challenge, but we always have questions about um, conservation mm -hmm. and preservation and how, for example, you're handling some of these mm -hmm. with your bare hands today, yeah. and you know, what does that mean in, yeah. in relation to the archives? Yeah, I get that question a lot. Why don't we use gloves? My hands are clean. <laughs> <laughs> I did not put lotion it's on true. them. It's true. They're very clean. Um, we usually don't use gloves, especially when it's with these fragile, fragile pieces of paper, because turning them can actually tear it if you're wearing gloves. So I did pull ones that are all in good condition that I can handle. We do have light limits. If you come to the gallery, you would notice that it's a little bit darker than most art galleries are because we have light limits on the documents, and they're only in on view for about four months. Mm -hmm. We don't show them much after that. And otherwise, they're stored in museum quality storage in our offices, in our offices in Washington, D.C., in our storage facilities. So, and digitization is a great preservation method because the more we digitize from our collections and make available online, the less people need to come and see them in person and handle them. So when we put them online, it usually means less handling from people. And it makes them more available, so you don't have to physically come to Washington, D.C. So we would, I would like be interested to hear if people have requests for what they would want to transcribe next. If there's a specific theme that stands out, we can choose some diaries from that. I think there was a mention of World War One, and we do have the stores diary. We also have a diary by an artist named Joseph Lyndon Smith, who was known for his copies of usually Egyptian and, and uh, classical artworks and sculptures and reliefs that he actually traveled to Egypt and would spend a lot of time in the ruins and he would paint set copies and then he'd bring them back and use them as teaching tools. And we have his World War I diary. He um, volunteered for the YMCA. And he wasn't, um, he wasn't a troop, but he went over to help organize troop entertainment for French troops. And this was a big program by the YMCA. So he put together plays, classes, and little events for the troops who were, um, who were based in France. So we have that diary. That's, That's really yeah, interesting. Would you tell us a little bit more about, um, because we haven't had a chance to talk mm -hmm. about the art of handwriting? Which of course right. they also involved yeah. with bringing into the transcription center. Yeah. So if you remember volunteers, we have um, all of these letters that we mm -hmm. shared and we've transcribed. And if you could maybe share a little more about that. Sure, we have a few more to add in the next few months. They're being digitized now. So the Art of Handwriting Project has been really exciting for me to work on because this is part of a project that will actually become a book called The Art of Handwriting. For each of the letters that were put on the transcription center, we had someone who was an expert on that artist. So it could have been a curator, it could have been another artist, it could have been an archivist, a graduate, a graduate student. We tried to get a wide range of perspectives on the handwriting. And we asked the individual person who was writing about the artist to think about their handwriting in a new way. Because often when you come to the archives and you become very familiar with these artists, as transcribers often do, when you are transcribing Peel, you really get to know his handwriting, and you get to know his quirks, and maybe his shorthand. And it's the same for scholars who are writing their dissertation on a particular artist. They become so familiar with their handwriting, they often don't stop and think, what does this handwriting say about their artwork? Does it tell me anything new? Because usually we're just in search of anecdotes and evidence that will support our ideas. So we wrote to a lot of people and said, 
you know, with their letters again. Some artists have really beautiful, really cultivated handwritings that they practiced, that they developed themselves, that would become their signature, their way to brand themselves, especially at a time that was when a lot of correspondence between collectors and dealers was handwritten. And so there are going to be about 50 letters total in the book, and most of them will be put on a transcription center. And we're really excited about this because the transcriptions will be included in the back of the book, and it'll make it easier for people to be able to understand the content of the letter because most of the book focuses on the aesthetic of the letter. And we're excited to thank the Transcription Center in the book and everyone who worked so hard. And thank you, Yvonne, for so much yeah, for working on these projects. It's really impressive. And what I really enjoyed from the pro learning about the project was the volunteers who were transcribing the letters tended to ask a lot of different questions, of different questions from the art historians and the archivists who were reading it. They were interested in something else, another side story that wasn't the focus of what someone else was interested in. So it really does give these layers to, added layers to what we know about the artist and what we know about the letter through the Transcription Center. So we've been able to learn more about our collections, which is always what we're trying to do. Yeah, one of these, it's, we always say you learn something new every day in yeah. the Transcription Center, and it's really, so true. really true. Um, so we have a couple of questions for you. One question is, any more women artists? And some questions about, the uh, mm -hmm. follow-on question would be also what it would be, uh, is there anything that gives examples of what it would be like to be a professional artist in the 19th century or early 20th century? Oh, sure. So we do have uh, more women artists that I'd be happy to add to the Transcription Center, including Mariette Charlton, who is a filmmaker, and hopefully more Virtue Daniel Whitney Diaries in the future. And professional artists in the late 19th, early 20th century, a good example for that might be the James Britton Diaries. He was a portraitist, and he lived in New York, and he, had, he was not afraid to share his opinions. He would go to the Met, and he would complain about artists. He complained that he was in the English in the net. <laughs> so yeah, it is, and he was also an art critic. So he has really sophisticated ideas about the art world and what um, what he thought would improve it or uh, make it what was making it worse because he was very opinionated. So we could put some of those up. I think those would be really interesting. And the Britain papers have been fully digitized. Great. Yeah. And then, what's your favorite diary? Is it like children? Favorite you diary. Well, Janice Lowry's diaries are always very um, near and dear to my heart because I think you, can, as being able to see her process as an artist, is really fascinating. I also love the diaries. Oh gosh, see. Well, one that I thought was really interesting is the diary. Clark. So my intern, my summer, our summer intern who worked at the Archives of America, found this really interesting diary. Let me just skip that. Sure. I'll have a middle name, but I don't think they're wrong. I'll still take them. Bye, Bye. 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 Alison Skinner Clark. I thought it might be stuff that middle name is different. Alison Skinner Clark was an artist that not a lot of people have heard of. And he has a childhood diary that, well, we'd call it a youth diary because he maintained it in his 20s. And this is really interesting to me because our intern was going through it. She did a ton of work on this exhibition because it was very time consuming, as you might imagine, to read a lot of diaries. So she was reading this one and she noticed that there are these moments in the diary where he's often being fitted for things like a corset and dresses. And he's working with his friend Mila to um, find earrings and jewelry. And he has this interest in dressing like a woman. And so eventually he does get this corset hand fitted for him and he gets this dress made for him. And on this day, they, and this is in, I think, 1908. It's pretty early in the 20th century. He go, and this online, I won't confirm. Um, he and his friends, they're all the same age, they're all in their 20s, decide that they're going to go out and he's going to dress like a woman. So in his diary, he accounts for the night and it sounded like it was a lot of fun. So he 
starts it out as himself, as Elson Skinner Clark, saying, I'm going to go out with my friends, we're going to go to this place and have this party. And then the handwriting changes, and it becomes more feminine, the handwriting itself. And he's saying, I wore girls' clothes, I dressed up as a girl, I wanted to wear earrings, but I couldn't, because he couldn't borrow the earrings sometime, I guess. And then it goes back to his handwriting. And for the entire entry, it alternates between handwriting. And because I'm interested in handwriting, we um, thought that this was a really interesting diary because he's changing perspectives as he's recounting his day. And that's, that's all we really know about it. He didn't do it too many other times um, in the diary. So he... Um, he did paint, he painted a lot of women that were wearing dresses that he would have been wearing. And he later, um, he's, he's remained close friends with his, with Mila, who helped him with it for most of their lives. And maybe have some really great correspondence between the two, but it was just a really interesting insight into his youth at the time and mm -hmm. what he was doing. And um, this instance of him changing his handwriting back and forth. Really interesting. Yeah, so it's um, one of my favorites because I think it's just um, raises a lot of questions, and that's what's really important about the archives. And we often think they serve as locations for evidence, but often the archives ask more questions than they can answer. That's really interesting. Well, I think that's kind of like you know, mm -hmm. transcription creates more yeah more data than you know, more data yes. to go through yeah. and, and search through. So we've had a couple of people ask um, about papers of gallery owners mm -hmm. and um, maybe uh, directors mm -hmm. of, of galleries or museums and things like that. Do you have any materials like that? that might be we have a lot out? of collections by gallery owners. Um, the Downtown Gallery Records, Leo Costelli Gallery Records. We have some pretty major galleries that um, we're participants and shapers and influencers of American art. Yeah, I, we have talked about putting some of those materials on the transcription center, especially the downtown gallery records. I think that there might be a pilot project with that to look forward to. But, um, well, is there anything else that you want to say about this um, exhibition here? I hope you're able to come to Washington, D.C. to visit it. If not, Look at the website online, and we'll continue to keep you updated on additional diaries that will be added to the Transcription Center. Hopefully, after the exhibition closes, we hope to continue to make the add more diaries to the Transcription Center. Would you tell us more about the dates of this exhibition? Sure. It goes through February 28, 2015. And after that, we're going to continue to add diaries because we keep finding more and more that if that we could digitize. Uh -huh. so. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, thank you so much, uh -huh. Mary. It's been absolutely you. fascinating. And volunteers, please continue to mm -hmm. send your questions in. And uh, if you have requests about different kinds of things you'd like mm -hmm. to transcribe next or, or uh, an observation in the transcription mm -hmm. center that might relate to something in wider Smithsonian collection, mm -hmm. we can track that for you. And also, I'll try and grab some pictures here and maybe show those yeah. out so you have an understanding of this really fascinating exhibition space, um, a day in the life mm -hmm. about diaries. Thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you all the volunteers. You guys are the best. All right, take care. Stop. Sure.